Right? Just like I believe that if Lot would have chose the plains instead of the valley that was near the cities, I believe if Abraham, or Abram at the time, later Abraham, would have had to have gone down into the valleys where the cities of the plain were, I believe that he'd have won them cities to God. Right? It's a picture of doing what you know is right versus doing what you know is wrong. Lot knew it was wrong to become entrenched with all them places, but he did it anyway. Abram, then later Abraham, no matter where he went, you find that God's blessing was on him. Why? Because he did right by God. It was accounted unto him for faith that he left everything that he knew and was looking for a city whose builder and maker was God. Well, there are some, there's a generation, that they don't want anything to do with what their father's generation did or their grandfather's generation or what was done ten years ago, let alone five years ago. They want things their way. Well, how do you know that? Because they cursed their father. You study the Old Testament law. Anybody that cursed their father was considered an outcast. He was thrown out of society. Civilized people wouldn't do business with that guy anymore. Right? Because if he doesn't show honor to his own father, then how's he going to show honor to you? Right? He was considered unhonorable. But then, it goes on to say, and doth not bless their mother. Right now, I get that nowadays, there's a lot of people that have born children that aren't actually mothers. But whoever raised you, if you can't, it may have been your biological mom or not, but whoever raised you as a mother, if you can't bless that person, there's something wrong with you. If you can't be good to the one that literally changed your diapers... Right, the one that taught you to walk, taught you to talk. The one that put in you, hopefully, the nurture and admonition of the Lord. The one that raised you the best that they could. Right, if you can't be good to that person, there's something wrong with you. What's wrong with these people? They're rebellious. They're not appreciative for the way that they were raised because they want to live a different way. They're not appreciative for what was provided to them. The protection literally the provisions, what they ate, their clothes, the roof that they had. They're not appreciative of it. In fact, they cursed their father because why'd you live that way when you could go out and live this way? Right? Why do you think so many people's family reunions are a mess? Because there is a generation that curses their father and does not bless their mother. Not well. Verse number 12, there's a generation that are pure in their own eyes yet is not watched from their filthiness. They're also self-righteous. There's a generation that even though the, to everybody else in the room, right, they're covered in muck and mire, they got some serious problems, right? I understand that Jesus taught that if you got a beam in your own eye, you can't go talk to somebody about the splinter in their eye, right? But if somebody's eye is hanging out of their head, I don't think it takes an optometrist to walk up to them and say, hey, I think something's wrong here. Now, there's some things, don't care who you are, that it's just wrong. It's filthy. Right? Well, there's some that not only are filthy, but they're righteous in their own eyes, so they remain unwashed. There's a generation that's pure in their own eyes. And yet is not washed from their filthiness. There are some people that think that they do a lot of good because, honestly, they go out and they do a lot of good. Not saying that what they do is righteousness, but there are people that give a lot to charitable organizations. There are people that give their time to go out and help and be a, you know, a support to other people in the community. There are people that sideline maybe their job or maybe sometimes their own family to go out and try and help other people. Those are noble aspirations. But there are some people that because of what they do, they think that they lack nothing. Okay, the church of Laodicea, Jesus wrote unto them through the apostle John that they were increased with goods and had need of nothing in their own eyes. Did they have a need? Yeah, they had a need for Jesus. They were saved, but they still needed more Jesus. Well, there's some people, because of what they do, 
It may not be because of what they have, but because of what they do, they think that they have need of nothing. Now see, even, go study the book of Leviticus. Okay, you can go read the Old Testament and the New Testament. There are some that are based all on what they do, not what they are. A lot of people know they got problems. But see, some people understand that their problems are actually a problem, and they try to get clean of it. Look again at verse number 12. There's a generation that are pure in their own eyes, and yet is not washed from their filthiness. Now, there's a lot of denominations, there's a lot of teachings, there's a lot of humanism, there's a lot of classes that you can go and take that'll teach you, supposedly, how to clean your own act up. Now, see, those people will admit that they are not righteous, that they are not pure, and that's why they're trying to clean themselves up. But see, this generation, they say that their new brand of purity, their own self-righteousness, is so great that they can live with all the stuff that you think is bad because what they found is so much gooder. I know that's not a word, but I'm trying to point out how dumb that logic is. Right? It doesn't matter that all this is still in my life because I have found this, and it is so much better. Well, if it was good, it would clean up the bad in your life. But yet there's a generation that think they can stay the way that they were, but yet everybody should still love them. Because of either what they do or what they give or all these other reasons, because they were quote-unquote born that way, hogwash. Right? Filthiness is filthiness. And by definition, righteousness or purity is the lack of filthiness. So anything that claims to be pure but yet still has filthiness attached to it isn't pure. Right? 24 karat gold is called 24 karat because the only thing in it is gold. If you add anything else to it, it's not 24 karat anymore. It's not as pure. Right? Purity is not a, you know, a, an ideal. It's something that you can achieve. Because God told you to be ye holy for I am holy. But you cannot be holy with filthiness attached to it. But yet there's a whole generation that claim they're right with God, that they're exactly where they need to be in the will of God, but yet they got a whole bunch of filthiness attached to them. And they see no need to be cleansed of it. All right, well, verse number 13. There's a generation. Oh, how lofty are their eyes. And their eyelids are lifted up. There's a generation that is very ambitious. I mean, I wasn't alive, but I've seen a whole lot of broadcasts. I've done a whole lot of reading about it. People thought that going to the moon was like crazy until they did it. And not only did they do it, they did it with a computer that had like a third of the amount of computing power of all the cell phones that you guys have in your pockets. But you go and stay, they did something really, really cool and really, really hard a very hard way. Right? They didn't have Garmin to say, turn here to get to the moon, right? They could only take all the fuel with them that they needed to get back on the way there, which means they couldn't just go, you know, doing donuts out in space or else they wouldn't have had enough gas to get back home. Right? All that had to be calculated before they left. Okay? That was a very ambitious goat butt. Haven't been back in a long time. Now we got people that are saying, hey, let's go to Mars. Why? Why? One, don't think you're ever going to get there according to the Word of God. But two, also, Mars isn't enough. Don't know if y'all saw NASA launched a Starship is closest that they've ever gotten to the sun before. Why? You know it's going to burn up. If you believe it's as hot as it is, why in the world would you launch something at it? You're going to lose it. Why? Because of data? It's hot. It's big. It makes light. But it, it, it's a star. Okay, God's got a name for it. I know that. I also know that when it goes away, it gets cold. And when it's out, it gets hot. 
how much more you need to know about it. Right? But there are people in their lives, they've got lofty expectations. Right? You, anybody ever meet somebody or grow up with somebody that, hey, one day I'm going to move to Hollywood and be famous? How'd that turn out for them? Right? They had lofty expectations, but they were humbled. Right? They had aspirations. They had great goals. But eventually, sooner or later, you're going to find out you were not born with the same basketball talents that Michael Jordan was. Okay? You were not born with the height that Shaq has. Okay? You cannot throw a football like Joe Burrow. Okay? You could try, but eventually you're going to find out you can't do that. Right? You can try to sing, but chances are you're not going to sound like Mariah Carey or... Well, Mariah Carey don't sound like Mariah Carey because now she uses, like, recordings. But um, she doesn't sing live anymore. Right? But you're not going to sound like Whitney Houston. You're not going to sound like Aretha Franklin. You're not going to sound like Elvis. Okay? You're going to sound like you because that's the way that God made you. But sooner or later, that's why I loved American Idol so much before they made everybody be nice. Right? When Simon used to be able to be mean to people, it was the greatest show ever. Right, because these people that think that they can, and you just see in their face, like, it's like, yes, that's what I'm watching for. I want you to realize that you're not special. Right, and you could say, Brother Jordan, that's mean. Some people need to be knocked down a few pegs, and I like seeing it happen. Okay? There's nothing better for me than watching somebody, like a politician on news, and then all of a sudden it dawned on them, like, oh my gosh, they found out the stats that disprove everything that I'm saying right now. And you see that little glimpse in their eyes, like, what in the world do I do now? I love it. It's fantastic. It's like, yeah, we're not dumb. Right? Welcome to planet Earth. We don't just believe everything that you say. Now, there's some people that need to be knocked down a few pegs. That's what growing up is. Right? The reason they used to they tell kids to go out there and play is because they're going to find out there's somebody out there bigger than them, tougher than them, smarter than them, quicker than them. Right? You found out early on, everybody had their own thing. But you weren't just the best at everything because your parents said so. Right? Or just because you thought you were going to be something didn't mean that you had the ability to be it. Right? It taught you humility. As a Christian, there are things that will humble you. Right? The first time that you think, well, I got this, and you step outside of God's grace and you realize you don't have this, that'll humble you. The first time that you try to handle something without praying over it or studying the Word of God, trying to find an answer on what you should do, and you just go with what you think is right, eventually that's going to humble you. Right? The first time that although you've been praying and you've been studying and something comes your way and you don't have any answer and you've got to sit there and wait on God for the answer, that'll humble you. The first time that it don't make sense what your soul's telling you to do through the Holy Ghost in the world and everybody around you saying that don't make sense, but yet you've got to step out on faith not knowing, like in the Indiana Jones movie, the third one, the last crusade, he had to take a step off of that ledge without able to be to see if he was going to land. He thought he was taking a step out into a cavern. And then what happened? Well, he actually fell a little bit, and then the step was a little bit lower. So even you thought he was going to fall. Until he did. Right? Faith doesn't make sense. And it humbles you when you have to use it. Because it's not, nothing in your control, nothing you can do. You've just got to obey and believe that God's going to do what he said he would do. That's a humbling experience. But there is a generation that know nothing about being humble. They know nothing about being humbled because now you can't speak out against them because that's considered, you know, a hate crime. You can't correct anybody anymore because that's their truth. No, there's right and wrong. There is no your truth and my truth. There is the truth and then there is fiction. Right? There is not... You know, your, you have an opinion, and we live in America where you have the right to be wrong if you want to. But that doesn't mean that what you think is right is right for everybody. 
But how have we gotten to the state that we've gotten to? Because people don't humble one another anymore. People don't have the gumption to stand up and say, hey, that's wrong, and I want you all to know that that's wrong. Because if you do that, you're going to end up in a mess. Right? There are people that don't get humbled anymore. You know what the point of competition is? To figure out who's best. When everybody gets a trophy, there are no winners. If nobody gets a trophy, there's no winners. Right? The point of competition is to figure out who's better than the other ones. And if you're not better than the other team, it humbles you. And you've got a choice. Either you quit or you start practicing harder. Those that practice harder get better. And eventually, when they, there's another competition, they find out that, hey, all that hard work, right, it was worth it. It paid off. We won this time. Right, that's called development. But now, because we don't want to offend nobody, everybody gets an MVP award. Well, then the kid that scored, you know, 500 points on his own, he, everybody knows he's the MVP, but he don't feel like it because everybody else said, well, the kid that sat on the bench and picked his nose was just as valuable as you were this year. But, well, there's a generation that now they set their sights real high. But it says, verse number 13, Oh, how lofty are their eyes, and their eyelids are lifted up. What's that mean? There's no humility. There's no chastening rod. There's no instruction to show, mm, not going to happen. You can, I mean, Riker can want to be a dinosaur all that he wants to, but Riker's not going to be a dinosaur. Can't happen. Right? Eventually, Riker's going to figure that out, hopefully. Right? As much as I want to be this, that, or the other, doesn't mean that it's going to happen. Your eyes are lifted up, but eventually your eyelids come back down to where you live. Right? To what God's given you. God's given unto everyone. The Bible talks about an equal measure of faith. He gave all of us an equal measure of life. He gave us all an equal measure once we got saved to the Holy Ghost. The Bible says that God gives spiritual gifts to those. We all get different ones, but how can they be used to the same effectiveness? Right? In God's eyes, we're all equal. Well, eventually somebody needs to humble us to where our eyelids come back down to realize, oh, we're just human. We do have problems. We're not the best at everything. I can't snap my fingers and expect the world to just bow down to me. Well, there's a whole generation that do. And their eyes are lofty, but their eyelids are never brought back down. If your eyelids come down, if you're looking up, you can't see nothing. You've got to look down in order to be able to see what you're doing again. Well, verse number 14. There's a generation whose teeth are as swords and their jaw teeth as knives to devour the poor from off the earth and the needy from among men. Does not the Bible say that the tongue is set on fire from hell? That words cut far much more than some physical wounds. That's why they do say that the pen is mightier than the sword because words have so much power. Well, according to verse number 14, there's a generation... They're not just satisfied with cutting words. Their teeth, it says, are as swords, and their jaw teeth. That's talking about their molars. Right? Them's the one that you're supposed to chew up like leafy green things with, and it's supposed to crunch, not cut. It says even their jaw teeth are as knives. You want to talk about a generation that's always cutting each other up one side and down the other? Look at social media. I mean, the internet, the Bible says there's blessing and cursing and everything. There's a lot of good on the internet. I mean, our generation has access to more information and biblical truth and biblical study via the internet than any other generation that has come before. 
If you want to learn how to program robots, you don't even have to go to college no more. You can turn on YouTube and find out how to do that. Right? There's website after website that will teach you whatever it is that you want to learn. That, that's why they used to call it the information superhighway. But what is it turned into? On one side, you have all of the things that are available, but on the other side, you have all these things that today's generation has to deal with that two or three generations ago know nothing about. The Internet gives you the ability to say whatever you want to without the threat of having the other person punch you in the nose. You know why I used to guys wouldn't walk up and say things about other guys' wives? Because they knew that the other guy would punch them. Nowadays, you can just type it, tweet it, send it on the Internet, and there's nobody there to punch you in the nose. That used to, if you said something crass to somebody, hey, meet me out in the street at high noon. Right? I'm so angry about what you said that one of us is going to have to die over it. That's what it used to be. Okay, I can't live knowing that you can go around and say all that stuff, or I'm going to live, but you're not going to be able to go around and say all that stuff no more. Not saying that was right. That's just how it used to be. Used to, if you are disrespectful to somebody in the community, they'd kick you out. Right? What do you think the pilgrims did? You think they had time for people running each other down all the time? No, they'd kick them out and say, no more food for you. Go hunt. Good luck. Well, there's a generation that they don't just talk about one another. Their front teeth are swords. Their rear teeth as knives. You know why teenage suicide has gone through the roof? Because there's a whole generation that's found out they can say whatever they want to with very little accountability. You know why teachers aren't allowed to correct certain behavior in the classroom? Uh, see, the first three before this. Parents believe that their children agree. You're not going to correct my kid. Well, if you did it, I wouldn't have to. There's your next line, Don. Okay. Footnote, I am not responsible for anything that would or would not cause you to be fired. That's between you and God. <laughs> but right, Everybody's afraid of offending somebody so nobody says anything and then you got a group of hoodlums that think they can go around and say you don't deserve to have a job anymore because you said something that I don't like or I don't think anybody else should go buy meals from here because they're against this or they're against that last I heard Chick-fil-A still the most popular fast food joint and they've publicly made a couple of stands that the liberals have all hated but yet they still go get chicken unless it's Sunday because you can't get it on Sunday Right? There are people that will still stand up against them, but yet there's those that come out and they try to devour them. Right? Not with, you know, they don't show up with guns. They don't show up with, you know, the posse with pitchforks and uh, torches. Right? They don't take you around the back of the barn and then beat the snot out of you and say, hey, don't do that again. What do they do? They try to devour you with words. Try to cut you. Uh, used to. I don't know if it's true. It may be an urban legend, but everybody most of the time has heard of the execution method called death by a thousand cuts. Right? You take an axe to the back of somebody's neck, they're dead. But if you give somebody a thousand paper cuts, eventually they're going to bleed out. Right? And it's excruciating. It's not over in an instant. Right? You've got to suffer through it. Most of the time they'd called a thousand, they never made it there. But, it does give perspective to how much suffering Christ did for you in the Hall of Praetorium. Because they said that he suffered it and his visage was marred much more. He didn't even look human anymore. The psalmist said through prophecy that his bones stare back at him. Uh, well, these people that have front, knee, front teeth as swords, rear teeth as knives, what do they do? They're trying to kill you with a thousand cuts. 
Well, if I say this, and somebody else says this, and somebody else says that, right, the suffering compounds. Well, who do they target? Look at verse number 14. To devour the poor from off of the earth and the needy from among men. They never go after the rich and the powerful. They never go against people that have self-confidence. It says the poor and the needy. Who are the poor? Those that know that they have a whole lot that they need. Right? When you're in need, you're very vulnerable. Because you know that if you, that need isn't met, that great harm or great loss is going to come to you. Now the Bible talks about our needs. Right? Physically, there's food and then there's raiment. The Bible says having food and raiment to be content therewith. You don't need a house, but God blesses us with houses. Hallelujah. But a lot of things you think you need physically, you need food and you need clothes to protect you from the elements and to keep you going. Spiritually, what do you need? You need Christ. But then afterwards, through the person of the Holy Ghost, you need the Word. God knew that people would need a place to come out and worship with other people. Right? We don't necessarily need a church building to worship, but we do need the church, the called out body of believers. But really, when you start thinking about all the things you need, the list is a whole lot shorter than what most people will tell you. But if you're truly in need, you become desperate. If you don't have a rock-solid faith or a blessed assurance to fall back on in a time of need, knowing that God promised to meet your needs. Right? The needy are very vulnerable. You know what they're focused on? What they need. They're not focused on you. They're not focused on what's going on around them. They're focused on what they need. They're distracted. They're easy targets. You know when alligators will go after land animals? When they bend down to drink water. What are they focused on? That they need a drink. What are they thinking about? That they're thirsty. They don't see the little air bubbles coming up out of the water. And next thing you know, they're gator food. Right? Those that are predators go after those that are distracted. That's the needy. That's the poor. Right? Can we not say that today we all stand in need of something? The poor are the weak. Well, I find that when I'm weak, then am I strong? Because God's strength is made perfect in weakness. But those that know nothing about it out in the world, those that are weak, those that maybe have been humble and realize that they need something, that usually means that they're in a prime position to be introduced to the Lord. But what does the world try to do? There's a generation that used to, even lost people take pity on those that were poor those that have been widowed those that the factory shut down and it wasn't their fault right just one day they find themselves without a job and without a paycheck the community would take care of people like that okay, they also knew who could work and who didn't and then them people's on their own but used to even lost folk would look at someone that had a need and if they had the ability to meet it they would used to people took care of other people wasn't any competition wasn't any putting a knife to each other's throat right if bad was happening to them they're part of your community they're part of your life that meant that something bad was happening in an area of your life so you wanted to go and be good to other people. Especially saved folk. We're without excuse. We've been blessed beyond measure. I mean, the least that we should be able to offer to anybody is a word fitly spoken if the Holy Ghost opens the door. To be an encouragement to somebody else. But yet there's a generation that they see others who may outwardly 
be needing something and instead of wanting to support they want to devour in truth you know why that is because the existence of people that are poor and needy truly reveal what's on the inside of them if what they had worked there wouldn't be poor and needy people so they try and sweep them under the rug get rid of them that's why Hitler got rid of the gypsies as part of those that he persecuted in the holocaust because he didn't like people that traveled around and would bring wares to town he considered them a stain on society he says Germany's good enough that you can buy a house you can settle down you can live you know in one place you can pick anywhere in Germany and you can put your pot down and you can have a successful life we don't need people that's roaming around all the time that was his mindset that he said those people are beneath us they dehumanized all the people that they sent to those concentration camps because if they thought about them as human then they'd have to realize they're just the same as they were but what's the world do they dehumanize the other person the poor and the needy they're not part of us even though they're cut from the same cloth because if they're cut from the same cloth that means that they're just as poor and needy so what do they do they try to devour them hoping to conceal the fact that on the inside they feel just the same way that that other person does hoping that by cutting them it'll make them feel better now what's he saying brother Jordan well in these verses four times each verse he says there is a generation well I believe that we're getting to the point that one day there's going to be the generation that matches all of this criteria there is a generation that doesn't honor their parents there is a generation that in verse number 12 they're pure and they're self righteous there is a generation that have lofty expectations and they're never humbled they're arrogant and in verse number 14 there is a generation that devour the others devour the poor and the needy well as we get closer and closer to this thing called the rapture I believe that there's the generation that matches all of this description you can go back through history and you can find a generation that thought that their parents were crazy to the point that they steered an entire country in a different direction you can find a generation that were real lofty in their own eyes and it caused them to crumble see Rome right? there is a generation right, who tried to devour one another and then as a result of it it causes everybody destruction there is a generation who were so self-righteous that they thought they had need of nothing and then usually they come in and were blindsided by another army that said well you guys got rid of your army and now we're here and we own this there were and there still are a generation but one day there's going to be the generation what's that generation if you put all of these together you think America's bad now? It's still going to get a whole lot worse. There is a generation that does all of these things, and I think that it lines up with the statement that in the last days it shall be in the days of Noah, where man's thoughts were evil continually. You can't accomplish and have the mindset of all four of these verses without having your heart just have free reign to go out and do whatever evil it desires well what are you saying brother George it's pretty bad out in the world but it's going to get a whole lot worse the question is whether or not you're satisfied with letting the world just destroy itself see I see that it's bad out there and I think God can still do a whole lot of good well how much can God do whatever God wants if we get out of the way do we want to be used well if we want to be used of God we have to yield to God or we can think that we know what's right and let pride keep us from accomplishing what he left us here to do which was win the world because there's coming a generation that's going to be the last generation that ever has a chance to hear the gospel and you think it's hard to win them now it's going to be so much harder to win them then they're self-righteous they got high expectations they're looking up here and refuse to even look at what they are 
Everything that you say, well, that sounds just like what my mom and dad used to say, and they were crazy too. And anybody that thinks different from them, what do they do? They try to kill them with mouths like knives and swords. Cut them down. I still believe we've got a reason to be here. God didn't forget about you. God didn't forget to rapture us out of here yet. No, the Bible says Jesus is staying and waiting. And as soon as he gets the go-ahead, in a moment in the twinkling of an eye, He's coming back to get you and is going to change you and we'll be with Him forevermore. So knowing that, if you're still here, what's the point? Because there's coming a generation that God's going to turn over to destruction. They're going to be allowed to buy in to what the Antichrist says. But one of them may be someone that you could reach. Got people all excited about you know, oh, this sports team did that, this sports team did that. Like, if your team wins a national championship, right, that's exciting. How come we don't treat somebody getting saved with the same amount of fervor, same amount of excitement? You realize that you robbed a soul from hell for all of eternity? Do you realize that Jesus broke the chains that the devil thought that he had secured? Yeah, it's hard to win a World Series or a Super Bowl championship or pick, insert sport here, championship. Yeah, it's hard. It takes a lot of effort, and it's worth celebrating. But how much more the fact that one who was born in sin, conceived in sin, only knew sin, trusted in one that had already paid the price, had the chains broken, and then now they were rescued, that's what saved means, from an eternity in hell. How come you don't get excited when somebody that you witness to gets saved? You know why I believe that used to people went out and were interested in soul winning more? Because they genuinely got excited when God used them to reach somebody else. That their soul did flip-flops on the inside of them just to be able to share what Jesus did for them at the house of God on Sunday. Just to tell somebody else about how much Jesus meant to them. Now, God opens the door, most of us shudder, start breaking out in a cold sweat, have a panic attack. Because you're so intimidated by the world. The world's already doomed. It's going to be consumed with fire one day. Right? The people in the world can intimidate you all they want to, doesn't change the fact they're dying and going to hell. And doesn't change the fact that God still wants you to tell the world that there is hope and His name is Jesus. But I don't know where the mentality came from. That if you witness to somebody, it has to be in a one-on-one -on -one situation where you can control everything and make yourself feel, you know, comfortable. No! Think of it this way, Brother Brian. If witnessing to somebody is supposed to make them feel uncomfortable with them dying and going to hell, why should it make your flesh feel comfortable? Because your flesh is still going back to the same place. The dirt, it's going to get burned up one day. That's why your flesh don't like witnessing. It reminds the flesh that one day it's going to die. But the inside of you should be stronger than the outside of you. Because that's what we're taught and that's what we should aspire to be. Is the new man be stronger than the old man. And the joy set before us should overcome any of that uncomfortableness of the flesh. We ought to crave to go out and share. The, why? Because there's coming a generation. There's coming a group that everything's going to be lined up and they're going to buy hook, line, and sinker everything that the Antichrist says. Not the news won't tell you, but I still believe there's a lot of people out there in the world that wouldn't buy into it right now. Well, that, what's that mean? The devil's going to have to make them desperate. God's going to have to give some over to a reprobate mind to make things a whole lot worse. But there is coming a generation. And when that generation gets here, our time's up. Our time, right, will then be spending judgment like we sang about this morning. 
There's coming a time when we're all going to have to stand before them and give an account. Part of your account is going to be what you did with this generation and if there's a next gener the next generation and so on and so forth. You're going to have to be accountable for how you interacted with the generation that God left you here on this earth to go out and win. Did you know that IBC is now on iTunes, TuneIn, SoundCloud, and Google Play? Head on over to your podcast provider and subscribe today. And as always, thanks for listening.